So I welcome you all for the afternoon session. Warm regards and much gratitude to all the dignitaries taking out time for us and coming here. The session titled Satellites and Drones Powering Synergistic Innovations. The integration of satellites and drones in a coordinated system creates a powerful tool set for data collection analysis and decision making, revolutionizing the industries and opening up new opportunities for innovations and problem solving. The session will be chaired and moderated by Air Marshal G.S. Bedi, AVSM, VMVSM retired, former DGIS. Sir, I'll take the opportunity to invite you here. Please on the stage, sir. I, our keynote address will be given by Mr. Paul Febre, CTO Satellite Applications Catapult. Sir will be joining us live. A hand of applause, please, for them. Special address by Dr. S.P. Agarwal, Director, NESAC. Dr. S.P. Agarwal, I'll invite you on the stage, please. Very warm welcome, sir. Our speakers, Mr. Paul Febri, CTO, Satellite Applications, Catapult UK, will be joining us live. Mr. Riaz Lamak, President, Mahadi Bagh Computers, Private Limited. Sir, I invite you on the stage, please. Group Captain, M.J. Augustine, VSM Retired. A very warm welcome, sir. Mr. Naveen Chitilapilli, CTO, Org Sensible Private Limited. A very warm welcome to the distinguished panel. I leave the session to the chair. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege and honor to be here in this panel. Uh, at least the speakers are well integrated, as you can see. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, a session uh, on satellites and drones, you know, synergizing the operations. Uh, uh, I, I also take this opportunity to uh, welcome Mr. Paul, who's online with us. Uh, uh, hello, Mr. Paul. Hope you're doing well. Yeah. Hello, I'm Marshall. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Uh, now, uh, when we look at the capabilities of uh, satellites and uh, uh, drones, uh, they always are looked at having different uh, capabilities. Now, if, uh, let's say, two entities were owning satellites and drones separately, they probably will look at each other uh, from competition point of view, you know, as if their capabilities are at a competition with uh, each other. Uh, you know, but when we see in uh, providing synergy uh, between both, we see that they are both, uh, uh, you know, covering the gaps of uh, each other. Uh, and as I see, if the, you know, drones get affected by weather, I can't uh, launch a drone uh, in inclement weather or, you know, uh, some other uh, weather phenomena. Satellite is immune to uh, that. At the same time, when satellites have uh, long uh, revisit times, I cannot get a picture uh, or a image on call sort of thing, then drones can help me uh, in doing that. If uh, drones are, uh, uh, you know, not very safe in a contested environment, then probably satellites do not have that kind of uh, limitations. Capabilities in each uh, domain are uh, increasing or getting enhanced uh, uh, dramatically and we heard the other day that now uh, drones probably will be carrying the quantum uh, keys as well that means you would have uh, lifted up the uh, your quantum stations uh, uh, you know to the place where you want uh, in the area that you want in mountainous terrain etc etc i mean it's unimaginable i myself learned about it uh, during the past two days uh, that I was here. Now we have uh, very eminent speakers uh, with us. What I'll do is I will keep briefly introducing uh, the speakers as I uh, call upon each uh, one of them. And uh, speakers are at liberty to say uh, whatever a little more they wish to uh, talk about themselves, uh, the field that they uh, represent, and then uh, present their uh, uh, talk. 
to uh, begin with we have with us uh, dr sp agarwal uh, he is the uh, director northeast uh, space application center uh, he has taken an important initiative towards effective utilization of uh, space technology for uh, various development activities in the northeast uh, region such as uh, natural resource management weather forecasting satcom applications disaster risk management uh, etc uh, he is highly accomplished scientist in remote sensing and gis application he has contributed immensely uh, in the capacity building and uh, outreach uh, program of uh, uh, isro he uh, he will enlighten us uh, uh, with his talk on the subject that we have just discussed uh, dr agrawal to you please presentation please this will work we have shared the screen okay fine so uh, thank you uh, chair sir so most respected chair mr bedi respected uh, panelist and distinguished uh, audience first of all i would like to thank uh, indian space congress organizers for inviting me to deliver a talk on satellite and uavs powering synergistic innovations uh, uh, i am from northeastern space application center and first of all i would like to compliment our honorable chair chair the way he has you know set the tone about that uh, this session very nicely have spoken what are the advantage of satellite technology what are the advantage of drone technologies so and uh, of course i always say they are complimenting each other uh, first of all i would like to tell something about uh, you know that uh, what is satellite scopes and limitations you may be aware that india isro indian space research organization have launched many satellites but uh, one thing is very important about indian space research organization basically we are working for the common people for the society so we have our satellites for the common people for example if we want to go for food security if you want to go for agriculture production if you want to look at the horticulture production we have a satellite if you want to look at the water resource assessment water resource management we have the satellite if you want to look in uh, into the urban uh, infrastructure management we have the satellite if you want to look at uh, any disaster which is happening whether it is a cloudy or not cloudy we have the satellites if you want to understand the ocean dynamics then we have the satellite if you want to look into the weather we have the satellite if you want to communicate we have the satellite and of course uh, we have uh, navic satellites also for uh, navigation so you can imagine we have all sort of satellites for the benefit of the common people nevertheless these satellites i have uh, by, divided into different components for example land and water resources we have resource set to resource set to a satellite uh, in fact uh, microwave sensors are there like reset 1 and eos uh, 4 satellite is there reset 2 satellite is there then we are having high resolution satellite i think you'll have to go to slide mode slides is not coming oh i don't know is how to uh, do that someone, uh, someone can help me because i tried this it is not working here no, here it is moving it there it's not moving there not oh, on the screen yeah okay. should be there no i think uh, duplicate you put no. now go to full screen yeah thank you thank you for reminding me so you see that different uh, sort of satellites are there so land water resources we have satellite then damage assessment and urban sprawl and urban management we have a cato set 2 cato set 3 cato set 1 reset 2 ocean we have ocean set 2 saral for altimetry and sket set for wind profile we have for weather like insat 3d and insat 3dr for communication there are many satellites like gsat 8 gsat 10 gsat 11 gsat 17 gsat 18 gsat 29 there are many satellites available now we are having more than 300 transponders and of course we are having navic uh, uh, which is navigation with in indian constellation basically it is a indian regional navigation satellite system irnss we call generally but now it is renamed as a navic by honorable prime minister of india so these are the satellites and what is the advantage of all these satellites are basically that uh, it once you launch it is fixed and we are getting repetitive you know information about the terrain uh, like you know that uh, so what information we get from that it is basically like 
for food security we get agriculture crop area assessment crop yield assessment type of the crop uh, not only that horticulture crop can you expand the horticulture crop or agriculture crop area in our country water security like water resource assessment water resource management water resource development all these things we can achieve using the remote sensing data environmental security which is also very very important like forest cover degradation degradation of the forest deforestation what are the gap area in the forest can we rejuvenate the forest can we you know expand the forest all these things you can achieve using the remote sensing data then of course disaster management support like flood inundation area landslide earthquake damage assessment you can get from the remote sensing and of course telecommunication is very very important and tele education tele medicine is another very important component of our isro satellite systems and uh, nowadays in fact for infrastructure development also we are using remote sensing satellites so you see that this host of you know applications are available using the space technology but you know there are certain limitations of these technologies which i'll come little later nevertheless let us move to the uav or drones which is also very very important and you may might have heard about uh, drones so there are different kind of drones so generally we say like you know that uh, uh, cropter type like rotocraft or quadcopter or we have a aeroplane or fixed wing type and we have a hybrid uav which is a copter also as well as the fixed wing each copter has some limitation and some advantage so one by one quickly i'll come to that to maintain the continuity for example this rotor craft type of uavs or quadcopter we say hexcopter we say they are good for mapping and surveillance of small areas like 1 is to 5 square kilometer they are very good in damage assessment during disaster agriculture in fact they are used for agriculture spraying also small pellet but only thing is a small pellet delivery up to 25 kg and can carry only rgb multi spectral and thermal payloads advantage very lightweight around 250 g to 5 kg highly portable easy to operate less maintenance do not required any runway that is uh, very very important especially for hilly, hilly area limitation not suitable for large area mission cannot carry very heavy payloads next one is the aeroplane kind of fixed wing kind of uavs and they are very good for you know mapping surveillance of large large area like 10 square kilometer to 100 square kilometer so at a short uh, you can you know map more than even 10 square kilometer or it can go up to 100 also detailed damage assessment relief material in fact they can be used for relief material dropping also agriculture forestry is even include including seed dropping heavy payload delivery up to 100 kg it can take but important thing is it can carry all the sensors which satellite can carry like rgb multi spectral thermal lidar hyper spectral and radar payload this is very very important advantage very stable flight can carry large payload limitations it is less portable this is a uh, big limitation and it is high maintenance like aeroplane need a runway for operations so in hilly terrain it will not work and difficult to operate in hilly terrain fine now this is the this is what very promising uav which i found especially in the northeast region where you have lot of hills uh, that uh, you know hybrid kind of things so mapping surveillance of all kind of terrain suitable for all kind of operations can do task for both copter type and fixed wing advantage do not need any runway though it will work as a air uh, the fixed wing but Need, do not do not to have any runway suitable to operate in hilly terrain can carry large payload so it is the basically uh, best of both the things like quadcopter as well as the uh, what fixed wing limitation less portable high maintenance and of course high cost quickly i will tell you in northeastern space application center department of space isro has given us lot many leverages about you know this technologies so we have quadcopter uh you can see here we have hexcopter we have hybrid copter also so these are the you know copters we are having and we are providing services to the user departments i'll come little later we have a quadcopter we have a hexcopter we have a hybrid uav we have all sort of sensors like rgb sensors we have multi spectral sensor we have thermal sensor we have hyper spectral we have recently we have procured lidar uh, sensor also application it is used for mapping monitoring and in fact relief and rescue operations also 
now applications of uavs crop monitoring disease insect weed crop progress crop stress chemical application fertilizer everybody is aware i am not going in detail land management also it is used forest fire deforestation river bank erosion wildlife it is used infrastructure inf inspection also now this uh, i would like to highlight here that government is giving, government of india through ministry of donor is giving lot of money to northeast region now they are having many projects more than you know 500 projects are there now they have given us this responsibility to monitor the progress of all 500 project at more than 1500 sites so what we are doing we are using the satellite data we are using the uav and we are using the mobile apps so together, so that, that's synergy, classical synergy, you know, synergistic use, utilization of all the three things. So we are using satellite data, high resolution satellite data like Cartosat 2 and Cartosat 3, which is having resolution of 65 centimeter and 25 centimeter or 30 centimeter. But remember, UAV has the resolution or spatial resolution is only 4 centimeter or 5 centimeter. So really we can see the progress of the project and more than 500 projects we are monitoring using this technology. Fiji root alignments, again we are doing using the UAV. Uh, first we are doing broad scale, we are doing from remote sensing, then minor scale like what is the cut fill ratio, what should the slope, how we should proceed, what should the width, uh, all these things we, we are getting through the UAV data. So combination of satellite and of course mining also, volumetric uh, what you call calculation. I would like to highlight here, you may be aware that Silong airport is a very small airport. Okay, uh, only small aircraft of some 72 seater can you know uh, touch down there they can land. But there was a problem a uh, few years back that they were having two hills, which is basically for landing a, you know, that you need a funnel kind of thing. So they were having two hills. So what they ask us, though we flow this, we flown the, our UAVs and we could able to get the cut fill ratio and we submitted the report and now those hills were cut and now very nicely they can land, plane can land over that. So that's the advantage of the UAV in, in synergy with the space application. Surveillance and monitoring, this is another very important thing. You might have heard about some, uh, sometimes back, there was, you know, uh, what you call, boat was missing in the river and they use UAV basically. So this is what you could directly, you can use it. Uh, medical emergency nowadays a big, you know, we have demonstrated this technology to the, uh, what you call, uh, one district in uh, Meghalaya and a lot of request is coming from various people that please provide us in not only uh, ICMR but AIMS also we got a request that please, please provide, design a UAV which can provide the medicine in hilly area. Okay, so for that uh, this UAV can be used and of course nowadays people are talking about the uh, ambulance and drones. I would just like to tell you through some images that remote sensing and uh, what do you call this UAV. Look at this. This is the Cartosat 2 of our ISRO satellite, 65 centimeter spatial resolution, and this is the 5 centimeter resolution of UAV data. Now, in synergy, a broad map you can prepare using the our Cartosat 2 satellite. Nevertheless, if you have a UAV data, a detailed analysis you can do using the UAV data, and very fine picture you can see right side. Uh, and now this another picture. Anyway, look at this image. So beautiful. Uh, maybe in laptop it is looks very beautiful. Uh, look at this. This gives a total picture of the terrain. What? How much is the agriculture area? How much is the forest area? What kind of terraces are there? For management, actually natural resource management, this is a classical. So combination of uh, what do you call satellite image as well as the UAV image we can use. Look at this image again. Uh, this is a beautiful image with 70 cent 7 centimeter of you know the that uh, uh, resolution, spatial resolution, and you can map the area. And uh, now this is another one. Like this is one left side satellite image, right side you can see agriculture field, but of course this is a barren field. So similarly in image also you can see there is no signature of red color, no signature of agriculture. Similarly through UAV also no signature. Only important thing is the resolution of UAV is 3.3 centimeter at this moment. And now this is a list 4 data. Similarly, forest area, but uh, if you see the small uh, this, you will see this kind of forest mapping you can do. In fact, recently we had a meeting with NDRF, uh, uh, 12th Battalion, uh, it was in uh, Arunachal Pradesh, and 1st Battalion, it was in uh, Guwahati. And we had a meeting with them, and they told us, we are having a lot of problem whenever some disaster happens. NDRF team has to go there, but it's very difficult to get the information what kind of terrain. They told me, I was surprised to know that they were not aware what kind of slope, and it was a very steep hill. So this type of information really you can provide to our NDRF or relief and rescue people using the UAV. Of course, I have shown them that how satellite image will create a 
टोटल थ्री डी परस्पेक्टिव व्यू ऑफ एंटायर टेन ऑफ अराउंड हंड्रेड फोर्टी किलोमीटर बाई हंड्रेड फोर्टी किलोमीटर नेवर लेस इफ यू वॉन्ट टू पिन पॉइंट देन यू कैन गो थ्रू यू ए वी एंड रियली यू कैन सी सच टाइप ऑफ इमेज इन द फॉरेस्ट एरिया दिस इज अदर वेरी क्लासिकल एग्जाम्पल एंड आई वॉन्ट टू हाईलाइट इयर द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ द सिनर्जी बिटवीन यू ए वी एंड सेटेलाइट इमेज वॉट एपिन्स इन द जून ऑफ ट्वेंटी टू लास्ट ईयर Uh, that there was a sudden you know heavy rainfall occurs in the barak valley as well as in a brahmaputra valley also and there was a breach in uh, embankment breach in the silchar city and then the entire city was inundated problem was whenever there is a flood flood comes from the heavy cloud means rains okay so whenever there is a flood chances are there clouds are there so our op optical data will not work another advantage disadvantage of optical data is repetitivity may be 5 days okay so then it is very difficult now the uh, relief and rescue people or these officers they want immediate information so i sent three teams in that area and they could able to capture such type of image from uav look at this very nice image you can see city urban area is visible now one more this is the breach point lot of hue at cry was there over it this is the breach point and uh, how that water flows from river to the urban area so this kind of total we could able to calculate number of breaches also and not only number of breaches if we can take some previous previous images then we can tell what is could be the cause of the race we found that this breach is very very important it is not because of the heavy flood that was the main made actually there's a different story so uh, anyway i don't want to speak about it probably those who are from that area they know that so this was available earlier also so this should, should this should have been filled up earlier but then it was not done and then suddenly rainfall occurred now this is another very important thing what happens uh, that the north uh, uh, northeast frontier railway you may be aware about it uh, that for northeast region that uh, that northeast frontier railway i got a call from dgm and he was asking me that satellite image is not working what to do and i want to map 85 km of the stretch of the you know that uh, railway line from beginning of that dima hosa district to the silchar i sent my team and they could able to map entire 85 km stretch and you will be surprised to know we could able to map and we could able to get more than 100 landslide across the train that railway line railway track and that was used for by them for dpr to get the money and to repair the things yes so you know you get the let long everything is available now this is one image i am showing you you can see one you know this debris flow landslide you can see here and this is a railway this is a train and railway line you can see but let, let me little bit zoom so it will make you very clear look at it this is the resolution we get actually this is 5 cm resolution you get and you can see the railway line also and you can see the actual position of the and you can see few things are there those there are some what do you call uh, 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 what do you call bulldozer kind of things are there all these things are there so you can use the remote sensing data sorry uav data from this but this is what 3d generation of and we could able to provide them all 3d of all different you know locations uh so this is this famous scene you must have seen because of the debris flow this has happened anyway now this is my final slide and this is what synergistic huge uh, may overcome overcome limitations that's what chairman sir has told so what are the advantage of satellite over uav autonomy it is autonomy any any picture you can take from any what you call for any place you want to take a picture of assam you can take you want to take picture of delhi you can take it's autonomy accessibility it is accessible to everybody consistency it is consistent because once you launch a satellite it is always there every 5 days or 10 days you will get the image scalability it is a huge scale and price is cheaper than compared to uav now let us come to the uav quality imaging i have already shown you you have a quality imaging with the uav precision very precise information you will get in fact uh, even that uh, not only just one example i have given you the railway line the railway line to track you can see not only that in between slippers are there that also how many slippers are damaged that also you can see ease of deployment any time you can deploy that's the advantage but only thing is the security and autonomy is the issue with this but together So you take the advantage of satellite you take the advantage of up you uh, uav and you can do the wonders so that's what i want to tell you thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr agrawal uh, very uh, valid points uh, no doubt that satellites uh, provide you the broader uh, picture and you can now do the uh, further analysis based on uh, 
uh, UAV, but I always make it a point that we are woefully short of uh, EO satellites. You know, we would have liked to have more number of them, not only for defense application, even for the kind of civil application uh, that he has uh, told. Northeast, I have been, all of us have been, uh, you know, in the service, been uh, in the Northeast sometime or the other. It's a very challenging uh, uh, terrain from weather prediction or from disaster's point of view. Uh, though Gurgaon is becoming equally challenging now, you may have some service to do there. Uh, very uh, good service towards farming sector, you know, that uh, crops, etc. The only, I think, challenge in this sector is that how do you convince the farmer that this technology is better than his traditional wisdom? Because small-scale farmers may not be able to afford very high-end technology. Landlords are making most use of it, but a small-scale farmer, you know, has got small land holding. Now, uh, you, uh, you have to convince him, so you have to find ways and means that he is able to utilize uh, this small technology which is, uh, you know, available for his uh, uh, betterment. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agrawal. Uh, our next speaker uh, will be Mr. Paul uh, Fevreur, uh, who has been waiting uh, online. Uh, he is the Chief Technology Officer at uh, Satellite Applications Catapult. Uh, he and his team uh, provide industry support in the creation and realization of technologically innovative uh, solutions to uh, the real world challenges. He has pre uh, previously worked for many years at uh, BT Research Laboratories uh, in uh, Ipswich, developing mobile and satellite radio communication system. I have been a personal user of BT system, Mr. Paul, uh, and I've visited Ipswich also while I was in uh, London as air attache. A uh, beautiful place and a wonderful uh, uh, service. Uh, over to you, Mr. Paul, for the next uh, 12 to 15 minutes, in case you can wind up. Thank you. really important to look at the, um, the, the links here. So can I just turn you to him, okay? Um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, we, are, we are able to, uh, we are able to hear you. Uh, little, uh, if you can uh, uh, slow the speech, I think that video is, uh, will be able to catch up with your audio. Yeah, thank you. I will put a slide up then, and I think it might actually be more helpful. Um, so today we are talking, of course, about the synergies between satellite and drones, and uh, we've just heard a fantastic description as to the potential uh, for integrating satellite and drone services, because they're so complementary. One of the things I'd like to just touch on is how we make this scale. And there's been some recent studies on the value, the economic value of drones. Um, and this is just one recent study by PricewaterhouseCooper in the UK, um, looking at the value that it brings to the economy of around £22 billion pounds of cost savings anticipated for things like information services, but also things that the drones can do that satellites can't do. Um, and one of the considerations here is the kind of services that drones can also support, for instance, the, um, the aspects of transport. Uh, it's not possible to deliver anything with satellites that you can with drones. <coughs> and one of the things to recognise is that in order to enable these different types of application, um, whether they be information services, shown on the left, or from an agricultural perspective, potentially avoiding um, the disruption of the land by using, for instance, uh, spraying, the drone delivery services, or even the future of our availability, all of these applications are really enabled when you take the human out of the loop and you're enabling the machine to work autonomously. And but that brings a lot of regulatory challenges. It brings challenges in the access to airspace. And it's these unmanaged airspace. It's not the air transport airspace. It's for air, it is perfectly being able to provide services from a satellite perspective. But it's these new airspaces where we're expecting drones to be working. And you can see that there's a distinction in the hazard environment. If you're uh, gathering information, you're generally not carrying much mass and you're operating where you're deliberately operating drones where there aren't any people because you can't you want to be in this way or you can't get from what where people aren't. When you start to spread things like agriculture, uh, you're increasing the risk. When you start to do things like drone delivery services, you're moving the drones near people, 
And finally, when you're carrying people, then you really have to have very high resilience. So the underpinning training systems for these are really critical. And this is where I think the aspect of satellites are really become important. And the, the stakeholders. So we're working with a whole range of stakeholders, both the, um, the, the infrastructure providers, the drone operators, the technology providers, and the standards bodies, the regulatory authorities. And what we've decided to do is to build test environments in the UK to allow the technology to be developed to a high level of assurance. We have our own drone ports, we have hangars, we have runways, and uh, airspace which we've cleared for the purposes of proving um, the interoperability between the technology. And this is being connected to a number of super highways across the UK that really enable you to prove the technology in one domain and then take it out and use it either in an agricultural context or in things like their delivery services. This is a roadmap, I'm not going to go through it at all today, but just touching on the point that really satellite services are an enabler, a critical enabler for the future exploitation of drones, whether they be for remote operation for, uh, for, for gathering information, for doing things like uh, assisting in agriculture, or then more integrated into society, uh, delivering services and potentially the future electric aviation. Um, and finally, the closing point here, what we see is that the technologies here are really um, necessary before we move to the future of electric aviation. So one of the, just to, to touch on, I think my previous speaker mentioned this, drones can actually operate all at all different scales. So you can have the piloted drones, the non-piloted or, or the autonomous drones, but you can actually run at high altitude to their satellites. Um, and these can provide an augmentation to communication services and information services where you have a hybrid of the technology that we use for satellites that are operating at 20 to uh, 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 50 foot meters or above, um, and providing a range extension for communication services and uh, intermediate uh, resolution for, uh, for, for information systems. And these kind of hybrid things are really helpful from the perspective of showing how satellites and terrestrial systems can work together. So that's the end of, of my quick overview. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Paul. Uh, uh, very valid and uh, definitely, you know, drones need uh, beyond uh, line of sight operations. I mean, when we, India, we had uh, majority of the drones which were, uh, or UAVs, line of sight uh, restricted and SATCOM connectivity is definitely a must. And another aspect of drones is that uh, basically to navigate itself, they need uh, satellite help. You know, I mean, both of them, most of them, what, all of them are GPS enabled. I mean, you know, in a way, uh, they are uh, having to depend on satellites to even go from place A to B. So there is a very uh, great uh, interconnect between drones and satellites to begin with at the very, very uh, uh, the stage of its uh, uh, birth, I would say. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Paul. I uh, hope you will stay with us till in the end uh, if some questions uh, are there. Uh, now, uh, our next uh, speaker would be our, uh, Group Captain Dr. M.J. Augustine. We know VSM. Uh, he's an accomplished uh, fighter pilot, has flown MiGs uh, and Mirage 2000. Uh, we have served in a squadron uh, together and learned from each other, uh, I must say. Uh, he's uh, been involved in orchestrating uh, uh, war plans for the Indian Air Force and also in, uh, you know, BMD uh, program. Uh, his spouse, you know, another accomplished Air Force officer, now retired of course, has, uh, uh, runs a company, Auto Micro US Aerotech Private Limited, and uh, he has done some amazing work uh, in drones, including uh, swarms. I uh, leave it to him. Uh, to give him uh, to give you uh, his point of view on satellite and uh, uh, drones about 15 minutes augustine yes. yes thank you uh, thank you sir for the kind introduction and uh, dr agarwal didn't require introduction any introduction because he's from isro and isro the name talks for itself so i need some thing to tell about me <laughs> as well as about the company, which is very, very small. So 
Uh, the topic of today is uh, satellites and drones and powering synergistic innovation. I, a lot of wind has been, from my sail, has been taken away by the chair. And whatever was left has been taken away by uh, <laughs> Dr. Agarwal. I expected this, so I sort of focused it to used cases. So that is what we are going to see, uh, what we have done, and how we can synergize. And th that has been uh, on our mind since we started working on this particular uh, used case, which we are going to discuss. And we always thought that it should be synergistic with existing satellite technology and not uh, you know, competing with it, exactly what uh, the chair put. So that is the theme of what I'm going to speak. This uh, Air Marshal has already covered. Apart from this, I also fly an Airbus. This is pretty different ways. I tried killing myself and uh, it didn't die. <laughs> so I'm here. It's about the company. <clears throat> so it's a group. So Automicro US Aerotech was the first company in 2015, one of the earliest drone companies to be formed, where we are focusing on drone robotics, IoT. It's an R&D center. We also have a training academy called the IDT Integrated Drone Training Academy where we provide training to people not only on drone flying but also on other aspects of drone. To give you a little example, a drone requires one pilot probably but uh, at least two engineers, one technician, somebody who designs it, somebody who tests it. You know the supply chain to make the drone available on site, the human supply chain or human capital required is anywhere between 11 to 15. Who are educating them? That is a question we asked ourselves and that is how, that is the uh, essence of IDTA being born. So at IDTA we focus on all other uh, training aspects. In fact, uh, recently, um, as recent as the uh, day before, uh, we've uh, in inducted children who can't uh, speak and hear, and, uh, you know, specially able children, but extremely uh, brainy kids getting into doing the manual work of putting the drone together. So that is one course we've started. So IDT is, uh, is a pride of ours. Aeron Dynamics is where we have a small manufacturing setup. All the necessary certification by Ministry of Civil Aviation exists and other certifications like any other company. MRO is something which we are looking at to launch probably by uh, Q4 this year or maybe Q1 next year. So this is how we're going to talk. Areas of synergy, a lot of it has been already been covered uh, by uh, Dr. Agarwal. All right, story of MiG-25. It's a very wonderful story and it happened when we were in the service. MiG-25 was an aeroplane which could fly at, uh, you know, it's a tris uh, trisonic aeroplane, fly at 60,000 feet, go into enemy airspace, get you good pictures. But it became redundant when satellite with submetric capability got launched. Now it didn't make any sense for India, Indian Air Force, to have this particular aeroplane, you know, uh, braving uh, <laughs> missile attack and whatnot something similar to the U-2 case and Gary Pass case. So sa satellite sort of replaced uh, the capability of MiG-25. So drone is, in some areas, is looking to replace satellites or probably has filled in the gaps which satellites cannot do. As we go along quickly, we'll see. Different kinds of drones he's already covered, so I'm not going to talk about it. There's a tail sitter that we are working on. So it takes off vertically, but if we're using the same engines, it flies forward also. Unlike the hybrid where the VTOL engines are redundant once the forward flight starts, because those four motors have to shut down for the forward flight. And it's a dead weight that you're carrying around for the next four hours or five hours or whenever you're, as long as you're flying. Tail sitter doesn't work like that. All three engines are used for vertical takeoff and landing as well as for the forward flight. Hail, male, you all are aware. UCAV, 
a couple of words, you need to understand the difference between UCAV and an armed UAV. They are not the same. UCAV is a combat UAV or a combat unmanned aerial vehicle which can fight against another manned or an unmanned aeroplane. So that is the essential difference. We tend to use an armed UAV and UCAV interchangeably, which is not correct. All right. So coming to synergy part. Space-based surveillance. Satellite orbits makes uh, satellite imagery unfit for tactic tactical battle monitoring. This, is, this was one area where satellite couldn't be used at all. And what do I mean by this? If you look at various orbital heights, you will get to know what, I mean, you will know what I'm, I'm uh, wanting to tell you. Leo is where you will get very good uh, resolution probably, but it's revisit time, it's uh, because it is flying so fast, you need lots and lots of satellites to, you know, look at a particular place. There is an aspect of it taking the image and downlinking to another station, and by the time you get it, the tactical battle is over. So it, it, satellite didn't give you that kind of visibility. So that was one big hole which was being fulfilled by a manned aeroplane, which now looks like that UAVs have sort of taken over that role. And in an, even in a contested airspace, like Chair was saying, a smaller UAV can uh, go in and operate with uh, impunity, which we are seeing in Ukraine quite a lot. I mean, there is no counter drone uh, activity that is happening in Ukraine when you're talking about UAVs of 250 gram size. You cannot simply pick it up. How will you, I mean, how will you shoot it down? So these are issues uh, which was there earlier now. UAVs have sort of taken over that space. Time involved in downlinking, which I covered with you already. Aeroplanes are not available for small tactical battles, which is a big challenge for Army. CICT operations, counter, uh, counter terrorism operations, it is not available. Manned aeroplane, even if they give a requisition to Air Force, Air Force cannot spare at that time for the entire probably CICT operations. That is where the drone is plugging in very beautifully. Today, no CICT operation take, uh, happens in the valley without the use of drones, and I'm telling you with my, I mean, I'm putting my neck out and telling you this. So drone sort of fits the bill here. So in surveillance, in areas where their gaps existed, drones have already taken over. So this is at Galwan, a drone which is given by us to the Army. After 72 hours, it was being landed, and this is the image of that. This is tethered drone. It's, it, the power is given from the ground. It can even work as data link. So you have a mesh link on top, and it is meshes with all other drones and giving you hundreds of kilometers. Theoretically, at 100 meters, it should give you under root of HR plus HT should give you on 185 kilometers of just the line of sight communication link. So that's the kind of potential this particular drone has. And that's the kind of potential which we are looking at in the Army today. Another drone of ours which we got some award. It is uh, interchangeable hybrid. So. If I put a boom, it becomes hybrid. If I do remove the boom, it becomes a fixed wing. In the fixed wing mode, it uh, flies for about 10 to 15 hours. In the hybrid mode, 4 to 5 hours. So I remove the boom, put another boom. The same aeroplane now becomes an hybrid aeroplane. MOD uh, production gave us some award for this. It is one of the main, main UAV. All right, this image we have already seen. He has covered that adequately. What I'm going to do is take on from there a satellite-based uh, remote sensing vis-a-vis -vis drone-based data. A lot of aspect has been thankfully covered by Dr. Agarwal, so my work becomes that much lesser. And agri sat based uh, monitoring, uh, what all does it give you? He has covered more than what I have uh, bulleted here. So let me take you directly to drone-based uh, agri sensing. There are areas where, like I told you about surveillance, there are areas where uh, satellite couldn't give you anything. There was a void that uh, satellite data couldn't do for farmers. The question exactly what Chair asked, will farmers uh, take this technology in? My answer to that is 99% of the farmers don't know what drones can do. Because the traditional remote sensing didn't cover those aspects which drones can cover. 
things like I'll, uh, so what we did is we onboarded few scientists and got on board with them and got multi multispectral camera. If anyone knows how NDVI works, it is uh, you stitch all images together, make an auto mosaic. It is standard, on field review is standard, canopy cover is standard. I'll straight away come to plant height is standard, which drone can do very beautifully, especially for a vertical crop with like sugarcane. Sugarcane set gets sold on its height. On the, on the length of the cane. So you can forward sell your product with yield prediction of many products. So different vegetation index is what I was going to talk to you about. So NDVI and DVI is being done, or soil, OSAVI, SAVI, soil adjusted uh, um, vegetation index is being done by satellites. But it is being done for large swath A, B, when the data comes to you, it comes to you as a sports mortem as what gone wrong, what's gone wrong, and not as what you could do now to recover it. So that is one essential difference. And secondly, the close-up image that he showed you, the DVIs, other all kinds of DVIs can give you down to leaf level infestation. Leaf color develops at the tip of the leaf. Satellites cannot pick it up. Drones can. The white fly eggs are laid at the root of the leaf. Satellite cannot pick it up. At when it is at the uh, egg stage, when it is completely, you know, crop is going to be destroyed. Yes, satellite can probably pick it up. So these are issues which where there existed a void which drones have now taken over beautifully. All kinds of uh, vegetation index exists. All kind of vegetation index has certain use case application. For example, uh, plant senescence. Plant senescence is not chlorophyll activity, it is rate of change of chlorophyll activity. If we put a little uh, you know, gray matter together, we understand. Rate of change of chlorophyll tells you what. There is a green plant, there is another green plant. Both are absolutely visually green. One has zero rate of change of chlorophyll, one has still some rate of change of chlorophyll is happening. What does it tell me now? It tells me that this plant is ready for cultivation. As opposed to this one, it has little more juice left for it to grow. There is some activity in this. So when I'm doing harvest, I should not harvest the one which is which has still rate of change of chlorophyll happening. You're getting the point? So that is plant senescence. That is another data which, uh, which can be processed using five images, IR, NIR, RGB. Just five. And there are various methods of putting it together. NDVI is. And I have visual minus NIR upon visual plus NIR. That is NDVI. So you can mix and match to identify down to what you want to see. You want to see um, you know, the top soil potassium or top soil uh, phosphorus. Everything can be identified because every element gives out a particular wavelength of light. I mean, I'm a little dark skinned person as opposed to chair. But you can make out dark skin colors different, isn't it? Because we give out light in a different uh, wavelength, though the light falling on us is the same. That is, I mean, the same thing is applicable to plant as well, or the elements in the plants as well. So GDVIs, renormalized DVI. So there are many uh, different vegetation index. Uh, let me quickly bring you down to field uniformity tool. Satellites cannot do this, do this at all. And this is a great tool, great data for um, the farmer. Rob RPCs, if you have sowed uh, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, on Excel it will throw up what, how much of crop you have and what is, which crop is less than one kg, which is more than one kg, which is more than two kgs. On an Excel, you'll get it on your phone. So these are the, uh, the things which we worked on took us one, one and a half years to develop and reach this level. Volume measurement is already covered. Hindi mein kehte hain, ek tasla bhi aapne agar is mein se mitti nikal liya hai, drone aapko bata dega ki ek tasla missing hai. Kal se aaj. So kal aapne ek imagery liya, aur aaj aapne imagery liya, is area se ek tasla missing hai, drone bata hai vega. Satellite won't be able to tell you. So that is the void which is dispelling it. Water pool, we have an M uh, MOU with Agriculture Insurance Corporation of India. Uh, this is where uh, maximum amount of dandli happens. 
you injure your crop and you claim the entire crop got lost when only a portion of your crop got lost. So that is where drones can really plug in and tell the insurance companies that this is the kind of damage and this much is what you need to pay. So it's a great tool for uh, agri-insurance people. We demonstrated this in Ernakulam. Disaster management, sir, like the point you covered, this is where great synergy between satellite data and drone data can happen. Great amount of synergy. Satellites can tell you this is the area where it got affected and that is where you go and deliver. Can't they deliver? Don't go by this <laughs> noise. This is my engineer speaking in the background. So this is this is what we demonstrated to Air Force in Pokhran. Survey. Survey is another great area. He talked about it. A great area when both satellite imagery and the drone imagery can plug in. This is a project which we did for ropeway between Chamba to Kilar over uh, Such Pass. They needed the 20, 30 centimeter contour lines. Of course, satellite can't provide you that because it is looking from top. You need to look from, from an angle to get, give you that kind of uh, contour line, especially when the valley is very steep. So that we did this project. Very exceptional use case for both data put together to come down to a solution where, uh, where uh, in total station parlance, if you take it, it would have taken years to complete this project, which we did it in weeks. So say opposed to two to three years or five years project was completed in one week, and that is the kind of uh, data that uh, comes in from uh, both satellite drone put together. It's a, it's a great use case to uh, demonstrate that. So with that, I have you know, sort of kept it between, within where we can synergistically work together. Another use case, as we were discussing and sitting down, a uh, speaker who's going to speak after me, we can probably even carry GPRs and find out what is under the, uh, how much of gold is under my house that I can excavate. Drones can carry it and tell you in real time as, or even make a model as to how much of gold is piled up where. And gold is a big commodity in Kerala. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Any questions, we'll take it on once chair allows us to. Thank you very much, uh, Augustine. Uh, uh, that was wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, uh, Augustine, we fondly called him Gusty. Uh, I have uh, uh, in Seven Squadron taught him how to fly Mirage 2000, incidentally. If I knew that he was going to be so knowledgeable, I would have instructed you with a little more respect. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm sure the audience will have questions which we can uh, take on later on. Uh, our, uh, <clears throat> I mean, very important points you made now. I don't want to, uh, just for the courtesy's sake, repeat them. But uh, uh, what I caught my attention was that when you said the crop is ready for cultivation, I think that is a uh, big thing to increase to improve yield. I mean, you know that uh, you uh, when is uh, the, the plant or you know any kind of crop is actually ready to its fullest uh, extent will affect the yield of the farmer, which uh, eventually benefits him. Uh, we have next uh, Mr. Riaz Lamak. Uh, he's the president at uh, Mahadi Bagh uh, Computers Private Limited. Uh, he contributes towards uh, facilitating capacity building, uh, preparedness, and performance quality assurance of communication solutions and on site uh, program uh, management. Over to you, uh, Mr. Riaz. You wish to say anything more about yourself? Please go ahead. And we look forward to listening to you. Hi, my name is Joachim S. Plan. I'm the Good afternoon, everyone. Esteemed chair, our very learned panelist, and esteemed audience. Sir has already introduced me, so I will not take much of my time. Uh, all I have to say is I have been into this industry 
for over 20 years. We don't, uh, I and my, uh, with my company, we don't sell any products or any solutions. What we are doing is uh, only ground services, and we are agnostic to all the platforms. So we have been doing installations right from a small VSAT, a large number of rollouts in thousands, to a very large earth station of, say, 9 meter, 11 meter, end to end. So that's one area. Second is we do training and certification from Global VSAT Forum on SATCOM. We do network audits. And we do facilitation and advisory teleport audits and things like that. Why I gave you a, a, this background is that I, uh, since I travel a lot and speak at different forums, uh, I have been moderated a number of times and have moderated also, especially by experts like Mr. Jeremy Rose at WeSAT and a number of places. So that gives us an opportunity to uh, know more about the new solutions and uh, new uh, hardware equipments available and happening in the world. And in line with that, to bring this to our Indian audience, today I'm uh, trying to bring a different facet to what we have been doing uh, since now all the eminent speakers have been talking about on usage of drones. Since it's connected with SATCOM, it was relevant to bring it here. A short story, the entrepreneur and owner of this QuadSat as a company, it was a startup about six and a half, seven years old, and initially they started with a concept, validated it, and established. So now they have already rolled out services, and all the top five, six satellite fleet operators have now given them a <clears throat> validation that any antenna tested with their solution uh, can be used on their uh, birds. Likewise, ESA has also now uh, funded them. And they have a lot of customers, satellite operators, service providers, equipment manufacturers designing new products, and military. NATO, Danish military have been regularly using their solution. So I'll j I have a small uh, video by the owner himself speaking, a uh, technical person, on the solution which he has brought, which is quite interesting and it's very cost effective. This is for antenna testing. Normally we had an antenna, then a bore site, and do all the calibrations. Here it is done with a drone. Second is uh, they mimic the drone paths on the trajectory of a LEO satellite so that you can validate your ground uh, infrastructure. So let's, let's have a look at what Mr. Joachim says. Founder of QuadSat. At QuadSat, we're using drone technology to empower seamless and secure access to the radio spectrum. Using our technology is a cost-efficient way of saving expenses uh, included in testing uh, uh, antenna systems, leading to less uh, downtime and savings for organizations. It also leads to optimized performance of antennas and radio frequency equipment, uh, enhancing the global connectivity. Uh, it is also an environmental uh, solution that promotes um, maximizing the efficiency of the equipment that you have. Uh, using drone technology gives a competitive edge in, in accurate diagnostics and allows uh, businesses to stay ahead, ahead in a rapidly evolving industry. Drone technology, uh, as we use it, is used in the research and development of new radio frequency technology, as well as when antennas and systems are brought onto satellite networks, they need to be qualified and make sure that they themselves can comply with the, the ex uh, expected standards. The system can also be used in production to ensure repeatability as well as when as a site acceptance test in terms of larger antennas that are built and installed on location needs to be qualified to make sure that actually the installation has happened according to how the uh, manufacturer's manual is set forward. The system, uh, system can also be used in troubleshooting and general maintenance to make sure that the, a certain performance quality is kept over time with antennas. Uh, 
The Quadsat system comprises uh, of a drone with a payload, a ground, ground control station that is together with a spectrum analyzer and an RTK system. The RTK system is a differential GPS system that ensures high accuracy of the drone system. Um, the, uh, the drone is mostly a transporter that is uh, programmed to follow a specific route that collects data. Underneath uh, a payload that transmits a test signal to the antenna on the test and, and makes sure that this is measured. The spectrum analyzer and the software on the ground then collects all of this data and merge it together with the position where the drone was and gives uh, the test results. Here you can see an example of one of the test results, um, which we call a raster scan. The raster scans enable an enhanced analysis of the antenna performance, and which gives uh, you as a designer or an operator of this antenna the complete understanding of that antenna in one picture. Another way of using drones is to, for example, simulate uh, satellite trajectories We've done this with uh, different of the mega constellation that uh, ensures uh, the performance of the antennas that they're able to track, which mitigates any risk when it comes to operating uh, constellations. Another way is to, uh, to produce principal cuts, uh, which can show compliance to regulatory standards and uh, ensure that the antenna is operating as it should. This data can also be used in link budgets to calculate how well the link performs. Uh, Quadsat has been working on uh, this technology for six years and um, in collaboration with Utilsat, SES, Immersat, Asiasat and Immersat, uh, Quadsat have achieved uh, a recognition to be able to test their antennas and, uh, and ensure that new antennas can get on their network. This uh, was done in a collaboration but with the European Space Agency where first um, an antenna was measured inside their laboratory in, in STEC um, and then was measured by the Quadsat solution. And you can see the comparative measurements here on the screen and you can see the agreement is almost identical between them. Quadsat uh, works with satellite operators to ensure minimum, uh, as a proactive way of ensuring minimum interference reaches uh, their uh, satellites as well as a way to qualify new antenna manufacturers. Quadsat always also works with service providers to provide new tools in the tool bag to, to measure and qualify their installations. Antenna manufacturers, uh, we help them qualify their antennas as well as th through their design and development cycle. We work with government and defense agencies in qualifying their installations as well as research institutions and academia on new and innovative technologies. Quasar was established in 2017 and set out to be the world's first antenna testing on-site solution um, in the world. We are a team of 30 uh, professionals from 23 nationalities sitting in sitting mostly in headquarters Denmark, where we also have an office in England. Upcoming offices in US and, and India. Uh, Quadsat is a, a company that's venture backed from major uh, uh, investors in the space and, uh, and uh, technology sector, as well as the Danish government. We work with some of the leading uh, organizations within satellite and, and SATCOM, uh, such as European Space Agency, Intellion, OneWeb, SES, Marlink, United Nations, and the Danish Defense. There is primarily two ways to engage with Quadsat, and the first one is that you have a specific need and you need uh, an antenna tested. In this way, you can engage with Quadsat or one of our partners uh, coming out to your facility and we do all the testing for you and hand over a, a final report that shows you at which state the antenna is at and what can be done with it. Another engagement model is that we can actually provide a system to you and, uh, and help uh, give you training and uh, supply you with all the things that you need to go out and make uh, measurements yourself. This is uh, uh, maybe a better solution for organization that has a lot of antennas uh, to test. Hi, my name is Joachim Asplan. So that, that's a brief about the solution. I'll be open to all the questions as and when the floor opens. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Riaz, for coordinating this. Uh, uh, now, uh, we uh, have next uh, online Mr. Naveen. 
Chitalapalli. Uh, he is CTO of uh, Oxen Silab Private Limited, which is a RF sensing payload and sensing missions with a focus on computational sensing. That's a lot of sensing, I must say. And insights from RF IQ data has experience in development of autonomous uh, secure drones. Over to you, uh, Mr. Navin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. Can you all hear me? Because I get a feel that I'm not very audible. Okay. So uh, if you, so it makes the job simple for me because most of the uh, panelists have covered uh, most areas in uh, drone um, synergy with satellite. One area I would like to talk about uh, is uh, in most of the presentations you saw the surface of the earth, right? All pictures and visible light. But so there are two things. There is, there is this other spectrum away from the visible light, which is the RF spectrum from microwave to terahertz. Which is the which reveals the unseen world for us, and uh, so that is one thing. And the other part is, uh, apart from the Earth's surface, there is this other area called atmosphere. So we focus on this unseen part, and uh, surface, subsurface, and the unseen aspect of the world. So that is that is the sensor that we are trying to build, because there are a lot of players out there. Uh, building the sensors in the visible region and, yeah, of course, hyperspectral as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the uh, the sensor that we we are trying to build. Uh, okay. So one more aspect that I would li like to say is, uh, never before in the history of the world has atmosphere been crisscrossed with a lot of signals, because after the coming of satellite internet, say one web was covered here, uh, Starlink, uh, a lot of them coming up with constellations uh, and constellations of each, uh, covering thousands and thousands of satellites. So the whole of the atmosphere is covered with signals. And we tap into this these signals of opportunity to reveal a lot of things about the atmosphere. It could be pollution, it could be the refractive index of the atmosphere. And from that uh, refractive index, you can get temperature, pressure, humidity. You can also measure uh, different kinds of gases. Uh, so what contributes to the pollution? Uh, these can be measured from us. So that is the sensor that we are trying to build. So our sensor, it's like. Uh, an RF sensor which uh, which listens on microwave to terahertz, uh, and uh, so you, you can equate it with the camera sensor, the image sensor. But the difference is that over, uh, in a camera sensor, it's just an imaging. Uh, over here, there are different modalities in which you try to uh, measure the atmosphere or the monitor the atmosphere. It could also be the surface of the sea. You can find the uh, height of a wave, height of the wave in, for maritime applications. And this can lead to information such as surface winds. So, so all these contribute to uh, a good weather forecasting system, a better weather forecasting system. Uh, so you would notice that uh, so. A lot of these satellites, the first speaker, uh, uh, Agrawal, uh, he spoke about a lot. Of, he, he had a slide with, which enumerated the uh, names of a lot of satellites. And uh, so uh, if you look at uh, these satellites, um, how, how do they synergize with the drone, uh, there was a need for a, a different scale in which imaging happened, or any any kind of modality. So there was a need for uh, HAPS. HAPS is a higher altitude which operates in a stratosphere. And that gives you a lot of information, which is a better scale. Uh, 
And a drone, of course, gives you a much uh, better scale. But there, there is one aspect the drones cannot do as maybe in, it is, it cannot be operated in all weather, uh, uh, not very easy to operate, a lot of issues in operating. As a, uh, as a builder of drone, I have had a lot of issues in getting a drone to work, uh, work in all kinds of weather. Uh, so this is where HAPS come in. HAPS, because it operates above the atmosphere, the planetary boundary layer of, say, uh, 2,000 meters, uh, it is not prone to any, any kind of uh, the weather that you see in the troposphere. So uh, you can very easily operate. So we, we would like to put our sensor on board the HAPS to measure uh, various aspects of the atmosphere. So that is uh, one part. Uh, the other part is uh, when it comes to the scale, we need all the three scales, satellite, the HAPS, and the drone. And uh, so it is like a multi-modality, multi-scale system. And when you derive or do an analytics on this uh, multi-scale data, it's like a multi-scale multi, multi -scale analysis. Uh, you're able to summarize most, most of the things that, are, that you get from the satellite and also get into the details. So in, in all in all, you get a very comprehensive picture of what you want to sense, especially on the atmosphere, subsurface, and the surface. So, so subsurface, uh, as uh, uh, Augustine brought up, uh, the GPR. So that is on the very low end of the spectrum. So that is also one area we we are focusing on because it reveals a lot of things. Uh, you can see our roads uh, keep getting dug up in inappropriate places. <laughs> uh, so th there is a need to map the subsurface utilities in the country under the road, what all things are there, the, the, the pipelines, the various kinds of tanks. Uh, so there is a need to map all those. So that is also one area we are focusing. With that, I'll come to the end of my talk. Yeah, I think I've not taken it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. No doubt about it. You know, while pictures look the glamorous part of the whole game, the signals remain hidden but are equally important. Uh, I know for sure that uh, even in the defense, uh, we uh, pay great attention to electronic intelligence because uh, while I may plan my strike missions based on the images available, safety of the aircraft in the air is essentially ensured based on how good uh, your electronic intelligence has been, that how well is your uh, RWR programmed and how well you are going to guard yourself against the uh, signals. And I would uh, go another step to say that most of your imaging or uh, you know, the requirement starts from the uh, uh, the uh, uh, interception of uh, signals. You know, that where are the emitters, uh, where the course position of the signal uh, or the emitter essentially comes from the signals. And that is when you now subsequently impose your uh, image satellite in that general area because, uh, yes, the localization may not be uh, very great. Thank you very much. I must thank all the panelists. Now, we have, I know we are coming towards the... End of, we have about five odd minutes left. Another five minutes we can overshoot into the tea time uh, with the permission. And uh, we'll take off any uh, questions uh, if the audience have. Yes, please. Is there a mic? Uh, so I heard Dr. Agarwal talking uh, about the capabilities uh, that we have uh, with regards to satellites and drone imagery in the Northeast. Uh, do you have any uh, formal integration with the SDMAs, that the State uh, Disaster Management Authorities? Because I've been conducting mock exercises over there to validate preparedness. We did not find any, unfortunately, representation from your organization, nor were your imageries or 
you know, the inputs that you provide, which are very critical and important, utilize for planning and uh, conducting disaster response. Now it is working. Fine. So thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, we are in touch, always in, connected with the Assam State Disaster Management Authority. Um, CEO of the Assam State Disaster Management Authority is uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Tripathi. Okay. Now what we are doing with them for last 10 years, from 2012 onwards, we started giving them the flood early warning, uh, you know, uh, around the lead time was 48 hours and 24 hours. That we are doing till date. In fact, in, if I tell you the statistics, in 22, 2022, which was you know highly affected by floods, we have given 60 alerts. And out of that, 58 were correct. Only two were the false alarm. Now, this year so far, we have given 17 alerts to Assam State Disaster Management Authority. So we are working with Assam because Brahmaputra River is a mainly flooding river. Nevertheless, we are also working with Meghalaya State Disaster Management Authority. We are also working with Arunachal Pradesh Assam uh, the State Disaster Management Authority. We are also working with Sikkim State Disaster Management Authorities. So these authorities, in fact, why I'm telling you, because these four authorities, already we are in touch in this during this period only. Because you are aware that in Meghalaya, a lot of landslide has occurred. In fact, uh, Honorable uh, Chief Minister of uh, Meghalaya, he called a review meeting of this preparation of the floods. And that time he invited me also, and I have given that what kind of, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, information we can provide to them. Uh, the visibility, I'm sure, because we are giving to a state disaster management authority, so you may not be aware, but they are aware about it. Okay, number one. Number two, uh, what uh, 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 now next st step is, we are, we are connecting ourselves with NDRF also. Because for relief and rescue, these UAV and satellite data provide a lot of information. In my presentation also, I told you. What actually state governments ask, actually, they ask us few things. One is the most important and the need of the hour is the early warning system of any disaster. So yes, we are very good in flood early warning system. But now they are asking about the landslide early warning system, which is really, really very difficult because there are many landslides. So what we have done, we have mapped the entire Northeast and we prepared a map of susceptibility map of landslides. Now, with that, at least we can say these landslides are there. They are susceptible. Anytime it, they are vulnerable, anytime there is a possibility of uh, you know, landslide may occur. So government can, uh, state government can look into it and they can accordingly plan it. But yes, there is still gap area that uh, we cannot predict, you know, that uh, when it is going to happen. But at research mode, National Remote Sensing Center, NSEC, we are working together and we are trying to put some instrument in different landslides to uh, pr what you call prepare ourselves for uh, landslide early warning system. You know, we are talking of early warning. I'm talking of response after the event occurs. So that is where uh, you need uh, situational awareness. You need to know what has happened where. Resources are at a premium. And it's not just NDRF which is going to be involved. It is the armed forces which is going to be involved. It is the central armed police forces which are going to be involved. It is SDRF going to be It is a whole of the government approach over there. So. Uh, I, would, I will connect with you after this. It, is a, it would be a good idea that your organization participates in these mock exercises so that your capabilities are utilized on a real-time basis when a disaster actually occurs. And the second uh, point which I told Mr. Durga also from, is, is, uh, from yeah. the National Remote Sensing Agency is that uh, it is a high time that we stopped working in silos. There is a national program on uh, landslide mitigation and uh, early warning system. They are putting sensors over there. Uh, these sensors now, how is the inputs from these sensors going to be fed on a real-time basis? That is where satellite communication prob can probably come in. So uh, it would be good, sir, that whatever you are doing can also be integrated at a national level with other platforms. And the response part I'm saying is where we need to, I suppose, yeah, sure. utilize your capabilities much better. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any 
more question maybe we can entertain one otherwise thank you very much thank you very much ladies and gentlemen uh, thank you panel thank you sir thank you distinguished panelists thank you chair thank you mr paul i'm very happy to have a very assertive and interactive audience here thank you for making this session so nice and informative now we'll head for the tea session and the tea session is combined at the oval hall tea area thank you sir i'll request to yeah please the uh, panel to have a good uh, group photograph please